Welcome to Chasing Ghosts. My name is Zach and I am currently an amateur paleontologist and fossil preparator for the paleontological group Familia Fossils. Residing in Pennsylvania, I've been lucky enough to have an abundance of sites across multiple geological time periods. It's a state full of fossilized material and is here I'll start my educational journey. Down the trail a bit, I hope to explore a world's worth of fossils, but for now, the Keystone State will do. These videos will be substantially longer than a trip vlog, as they're meant to be a deep dive into the complete history of whatever spot I find myself at. I have the video separated into chapters for those more interested in the digging and discovery process, but for the rest, I have the information available to form a complete image of the environments that previously existed and how they found themselves recorded into history by the world we inhabit today. I am deeply excited to have this opportunity, and I hope you find yourself entertained yet intrigued by the otherworldly environments trapped in stone for us to stumble upon today. Enough about me, welcome to Chasing Ghosts. Tucked beyond the wooded roads of Pennsylvania lies a 3,500 acre park teeming with opportunities for the public to enjoy. Spanning across three counties, containing eight miles of Soterra Creek, as well as 35 miles of hiking trails with sites and attractions along the way, this is a park with something for everyone. Soterra State Park is a relatively new park being founded in 1987 after the government claimed multiple homes by eminent domain. However, the area it encompasses has been in use for centuries. So Terra Creek and the land surrounding it was used by the indigenous Susquehannock tribe for trade and travel networks. As European immigrants settled the areas of Pine Grove and Jonestown, they also found the creek useful for trade and transportation. So much so that the Union Canal Company found themselves completing Lock 9 of the Union Canal here in 1830. While the Union Canal Company was fraught with corporate and economic turmoil, the canal itself was successful in linking anthracitic coal mines in Tremont to industrial districts and cities across southeastern Pennsylvania. Despite the success of the canal, poor financial practice from the company, combined with a catastrophic flood in 1862, led to the abandonment of Lock 9. Despite this setback, coal from the mines in Tremont and Pine Grove was of still a vital commodity. So in 1870, the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad Company introduced a rail line linking Pine Grove to Lebanon. This line was in use for close to a century before road networks began to dominate the area, and it is here our fossil adventure begins. During the construction of the railway, a cut was made into the Ordovician Age Warrensburg Formation, later renamed the Reedsville Shay. This cut was widened following the construction of Interstate 81. Most of the Martinsburg Formation is barren in the eyes of collectors as it was formed in a deep basin. However, this site was unique. This site provided the habitat and conditions for the preservation of starfish, brachiopods, crinoids, multiple species of trilobites, and possibly rare eurypterids. With a spot boasting such a keen opportunity to the public, it was no surprise people flocked to the site to obtain their own unique slice of the Ordovician. However, they were unknowingly undermining the stability of the interstate bridges, and in the late 90s, Penn Dot closed the site. However, collectors stumbled and continued to return to the site to split rock, and in 2004, PennDOT enact a construction project, widening the road and filling it with the limestone that remains here today. Although shale from the gap was quickly processed down by eager collectors hoping to get one last chance from the site, the new location the material was dumped at became a topic of discussion. Here, the Sudberg site was born, and unlike the previous, this one still exists, accessible to the public today. 
Found alongside Swatera's Bear Hole Trail, an unassuming dirt mound sits peacefully overlooking hikers and bikers unaware of the treasures within. Confused with an active construction site, those curious enough to poke around will quickly find fossils exposed by the elements from the hillside. Despite the lengthy introduction, this is where I find myself today, and by the end of this video, I plan to form a complete image of the environment that existed here millions of years ago. About 375 million years ago, towards the middle to late Devonian, the ecosystem present here in Pennsylvania was vastly different. Most of the state was under a shallow inland sea fed by the Ryuk Ocean. This ancient body of water was called the Kaskaskian Sea and is primarily responsible for the deposition of the Mahantango Formation. During the Middle Devonian, the North American Plate slammed into the Eurasian Plate for a second time, solidifying the Appalachian Mountain Range. Little else in Pennsylvania was above water, and at the time, the state was being formed under the Appalachian Basin, about 15 to 20 degrees south of the equator. Here, a temperate climate allowed life to thrive in what was sometimes an anoxic body of water. Despite frequent violent weather patterns, this shallow basin provided environment for life to call home. Most of the basin was suitable habitat for smaller coral reefs and filter feeding organisms in shallow, gentle currents. Deeper shelves of the basin would hold abundant brachiopod and bivalve variations along with a few trilobite species. Violent storms causing mass erosion would often flood sediments into the water, encasing living organisms. Along with this, tidal currents would often collect dead organisms and deposit them into the fine siltstone that would later characterize the Mahantango Formation. The Mahantango Formation is a Devonian Age formation running from West Virginia to Southern New York. It overlies the popular Marcella Shale and underlies the Tully Limestone that separates the formation from New York's Hamilton Group. There are numerous localities across Pennsylvania exhibiting rock from the Mahantango. Portions of this formation were formed by transgression-regression cycles where the sea would rise and fall. Other sections were formed in storm-dominated environments recording ripple marks as well as brachiopods scattered and shattered throughout its layers. Here at the Sudberg site, tidal currents collected dead organisms and deposited them into oval-shaped lenses that were quickly buried by further layers of silt. This allowed the casts of organisms to become successfully encased in stone. Unfortunately, due to diagenetic conditions while forming the silt into stone, shell preservation is not present at the Sudberg site. So you want to find fossils. Maybe you've been putting the hours in arc and want to crack a trilobite of your own. Well, we have a bit of planning to do first because there is a lot that goes on around us during the digging process. One of the best variables you can have on your side is weather because a dry, sunny day helps maximize the chances you ID a fossil coming out of the ground. Now, to help you plan for your trip, I'm going to show you the kit I run while digging. One of the best tools you can invest in is a good backpack. We do a little bit of hiking while digging, and as you can see, I carry a lot of stuff. This has good back support to help disperse the weight I'm carrying on my back during the hike. Well, the next thing I pack is a consumables bag, and in it, I keep a basic first aid kit. Doesn't need to be complicated, just needs to get the job done batteries and charging cables for whatever I need during the dig. Bag with a little bit of fire starter because I never know when I'm going to need it. And bug spray and sunscreen, especially for the summer months. Next thing I carry is some light sources. Sometimes I'm digging up to dark, sometimes I'm digging past dark, so having a little bit of light helps. I use rags, but you can use paper towels, newspaper, or old t-shirts combined with good tin foil to help wrap up and protect the finds you uncover. 
Another good tool you can invest in is an ID guide to help you ID the fossils that are coming out of the ground. A little self-explanatory. Now we're going to talk about the fun stuff. We're going to talk about the tools of the trade here. Most of these are optional based off of where you're digging and your preferences. However, I'm going to talk about what I run and what you can settle for if you're just starting out. I like to always keep a good pack knife on me because you never know quite when you're going to need it. Eye protection is vital. Rocks get flying while you're hammering on them and you can't ID your fossils if you can't see. A good pair of gloves protect your hands from cuts, scrapes, and bashes during the warmer months and they keep your hands warm during the cooler months. I like to have two different types of shovels on me. I like a little trowel for the smaller areas and when you're clearing off a bigger area I got a foldable shovel here that folds up well and goes into a bag. A good hardware hammer and screwdriver will get you pretty far when you're starting out. Kids, don't steal your father's tools. You can go thrift some for cheap. Now we're going to talk about what I use the most. I use guardless chisels when I'm working out long sections of rock to further split down. I use hand guarded chisels when I'm splitting down those longer sections because they help protect your hand from getting bashed. I use two different types of hammers. I like S-Wing hammers because I have never had to replace these. And what I use, the geology pick or a masonry hammer. You don't need to use S-Wing though. You can get this guy off of Amazon. Solid mallet for splitting down big rock, hitting it with power. And I like to use a big geology pick for clearing the overburden off of big sections of bench. Now that we're ready to go, let's go hit what I've dubbed the pit. Now that we've arrived, it's time to find the winning spot. The hill in front of us can seem intimidating at first because there's so much rock with seemingly so little time. But like gambling, it's a numbers game. There are a few things you can do, however, to narrow into a productive spot. If you arrive on a packed day, Socialize with those you're digging alongside. Some might want their quiet, but it only takes one person with advice to aid your efforts. Observe how they're digging, what they're finding, and where along the hill they chose to dig. All these minute details will help narrow yourself into a productive layer. Now that we've picked a spot, we can get set up. It helps to lay out your tools in a designated area so they don't get buried. Check out the ID guide one last time and get a bit of water because now the work begins. To start our dig, it helps to clear out all overburden to fully expose bedrock. After this, we begin a process of removing larger sections of bedrock to then process down. This step is important because it helps protect our finds from as much damage as possible. You will be able to find fossils by removing small rocks out of situ but this process is less controllable than removing the larger blocks to further break down, resulting in damaged fossils. The moment you decide to take the lazy approach is the moment you'll damage what would have been a trophy find. Now that you know how to dig, I'm going to step down from the teaching role and get digging myself. of a marvelous bug.
managed to pick up a pretty cool bug here by the creek. You can see the pleure there and the pagidium. I think it's headless. We'll see when we clean it up at home. little look at the layer here and what's coming out of it i'd love to find this guy complete there's actually quite a few green ops pagidiums on this guy pretty sick i've been digging for close to an hour here in that hour, I've been splitting down probably four or five blocks. I got like seven or eight green ops pigeons here. Set them out for kids to find. With that, for those seven or eight, I got one decent bug here. It's actually just the cast of it I found on the surface, but you can see there. Decent green ops missing this portion of the head, but get back to digging here. site I found. Because of this, I've had the opportunity to dedicate close to 100 hours of my time digging there, as well as meeting fellow collectors who have also excavated the site. There are definitely more knowledgeable collectors than I, but I know enough to confidently display the biodiversity of this site. This slice of the Maha Tango has a wide variety of animal species, each filling their own environmental niche. We'll start with the brachiopod and bivalves. From my time digging, I've been able to find the following species of shells. Lingula, Strophodonta, Mucrospirifer, Nucleides, Nucleidea, and Paleonilo. There are a ton of different shell variations, but these are the major species I've been able to find and successfully identify. This site also has a few species of gastropods or sea snails. These include Bembexia, Platoceras, Holotrochus, and Naticonema. In addition to sea snails, there are a couple of cephalopod or squid species to be found, those being Michaelinoceras and Spiroceras. There are a few different variants of Cnidaria and Bryzoa, including a horned coral specimen known as Stereolasma, and Bryzoan species Fenestella, Trachypora, and Polypora. Echinoderms at this site are rarely found. Crinoid stems, often confused for starfish by beginners because of the five-point symmetry, are abundant. However, complete specimens are extremely rare. Starfish have not been confirmed at this site and are rarely found within the Mahantango. In fact, only three Devonaster species have been recovered from the formation, one of which I found as well as one Eurostellara specimen recovered according to my research. Last, but certainly not least, there are a few trilobite species to be found. Arguably, the most common trilobite to be found at this site is Algidrops rana, formerly known as Fake Ops. There is also Green Ops Boothy, and while you can find tons of pagidiums from this species, complete specimens can be somewhat rare. Now, the trophy bug, Decanella. This species is from the proeated family of trilobites and is extremely rare to find complete. There are a ton of other animals to find at this site, 
However, these are either the most common or the species I've been able to successfully identify. Well, Wanderer, it seems our adventure is coming to a close. The fire's burning low, the sun's going down, and I've told you everything I have to tell. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope I've aided your paleontological efforts. To improve both future video quality as well as factual information, I'd love to hear your comments in the comments section below. If you like this video, leave a like. If you dislike this video, leave a dislike. If you'd like to support the channel going forward, you can visit both my Patreon at Chasing Ghosts and you can check out our website, familiafossils.net, where we sell quality fossils at competitive prices. I appreciate you sticking it out to the end, but as for now, this was Chasing Ghosts.